Hey everyone, I'm Patrick, a software architect at Interest in Product Design and Electronics. Today I want to show you two interesting products that I have, Erased and Radiacode 103. Both of those devices are scintillation devices. I'll talk about what it is in a moment as well. Then I'll try to describe what it takes to design a good product and how it would be possible to design a product that could satisfy not only hobbyists, but also more professional users. This video is not sponsored by anyone. The statements made here are my personal opinions, and I prefer it to stay like that. I am not a nuclear engineer, nor a person that's ever manufactured a scintillation device, so my research on the topic does not take into account all aspects of building such a device. Quite some theory was told about scintillation devices on YouTube, and there is substantial information on the internet available, but I want to stress some common misconceptions here in terms of a form of a scintillation device. Quickly talking about basics. A scintillation crystal works in a simple principle. Its electrons in the material get energized with an absorption of a radiation and go to higher orbitals. Upon going down the orbitals, the spare energy is given as photons, hence material fluorescence. This is a different mechanism that uh, classical Geiger-Müller tube works. The physics of such crystals is an actively researched area of physics, with new materials being discovered on a regular basis. As the portfolio of usable materials is getting bigger, engineers gain more possibilities. Carl Wills did an amazing experiment to compare various crystals. Here is a screenshot of the experiment with pointed cesium iodide activated with thallium, which is being used by the tested devices. Interestingly, this material has not only very good characteristics for the intensity, it also generates lights in the 550 nanometer spectrum, which will be useful later. Now, how to build a device that would give us a glimpse into the world of high-energy gamma radiation? On Wikipedia, we can see a simple diagram of such a device. A high-energy radiation enters a scintillation crystal that give off photons that then are picked up by a specialistic photomultiplier tube that later provides signals to a counter logic. This design is more of a historical note nowadays, as tubes are generally treated as a legacy component, although some of newer devices, including the tested devices, follow a similar principle of a scintillator and a photomultiplier silicon component logic. We will see later how more cutting-edge scintillators can be built differently. If we look at a typical scintillation device, we can notice they consist of two parts, a scintillation probe and a counter, like shown in the picture. Those products are usually expensive and aren't top-notch in terms of technological advancements, so why are they still being sold? There are many reasons for this state to happen, and those reasons are quite common across engineering domains. Dave from EEV blog gave a list of good cases for fluke multimeters, a US brand of multimeters mostly famous for producing expensive yellow meteorological instruments. As Dave mentioned in case of fluke, the fact of being produced in the US opens doors to all sorts of government military contracts. On top of that, different organizations, government bodies and military have written documentation that describes specific products and models. On top of that, because of longevity of production and characteristics of a given product are well known, the measurement confidence is high. If you, as a product designer, focus on innovation to gain market or are just a hobbyist, you don't focus on that. If you look at this image of innovator's curve, we can assume that similarly to Fluke, classical Geiger counters are luggers or late majority at best. Scintillation devices based on tubes may be more of an early majority. In order to set a baseline for a commercial product, 
Let's have a look at what open source space has to offer. As recommended by our project Open Gamma Detector, which gives us for free a hardware scintillation device, the project recommends sodium iodide or cesium iodine scintillators. Moreover, they suggest to use microFC 60035 SMTTR silicon photomultiplier. Fortunately, this chip is quite accessible and relatively cheap to buy. And we can see they can handle the mentioned crystals OK, with 15 to 22% capture rate for cesium iodine crystal. What is also important, the Open Gamma project has developed not only a detector, but also a web application for gamma spectroscopy. Good job! Both of those devices have similar build, are small black boxes. RadioCode has a monochromatic screen that displays current measurement and allows for configuration. Rayset is a smaller size, looks like a matchbox, and has no screen, only a diode to visualize measured counts and power button. Both of those devices come with an application for Android, and RadioCode has also an iOS app and a Windows app. For the testing, I will use an Android phone, so let's have a brief look at most important aspects of those apps. Here you can see RadioCode 103 mobile app on Android with counts per second, radiation dose, and also spectrum. Here you can see Rayset mobile application, also with counts per second, radiation dose, and a spectrum. Now let's talk about the scintillation crystal and its most critical aspect of the device. Radiocode 103 has one cubic centimeter of cesium ionide activated with thallium, which is visualized here. Rayseed has five cubic centimeters of the same material and the difference is uh, easily visible and this will dictate the further tests. I'm sure you know in what direction. Radiocode crystal is super small, consider the oversized product. Since we went through the basics of the scintillation devices world, we can move on to the testing of the two mentioned products, Rayseed and Radiocode 103. I have prepared two simple tests to compare the devices, one with norms that is naturally occurring for the active materials that are the source of our natural background radiation and a sample uranium glass that contains low amounts of uranium. The first sample is a so-called healthier version of a table salt that is not applying sodium chloride but one that contains potassium chloride. This particular sample comes with 30% of sodium chloride and 70% potassium chloride. As we know, there is a small fraction of unstable potassium K40 in the earth, which we should be able to detect in this product. The radioactive decay products of the K40 is very simple. It decays to argon-40 and calcium-40, both of which are stable isotopes. Because of that, spectrum analysis of potassium-40 is simple. As with uranium, it's a totally different story. Uranium decay schemes are long and different for different isotopes. Even decay of a single uranium isotope, U238, most common one, consists of over 15 steps. And there are three naturally occurring isotopes of this element. It makes the spectrum analysis complicated and practically only professionals are able to detect spectral analysis. It also is a quite a good benchmark for our testing products if they are able to provide good enough resolution to understand what we are measuring. Let's put the device on top of the salt and observe the measurement. After 10 minutes, we can see that the value for the dose rate is higher. Now let's put the Rayseed device on top of the salt and observe the measurement.
after 10 minutes, we can clearly see that the values for the CPS are higher and have higher peaks. And we can also see clear peaks for the K4T. Okay, we saw that both of those devices are detecting increased amounts of radiation caused by one of major naturally occurring unstable isotopes and are able to detect uh, what we see. What about some uranium enclosed in the form of this scholar bear? Let's try first with the radiocode 103. After 10 minutes, we can see that the dose rate is significantly higher, as well as the count rate. Since we now saw an example of what one cubic centimeter of a scintillator can do, let's see how RACID is behaving on this weak source. After 10 minutes, we can see that the CPS values are significantly higher, although it's hard to understand the spectral analysis. Here is a table of the results of our tests. We can see both of those devices are able to detect K40 without issues, although they have troubles with spectrum analysis of uranium samples and RACID is able to detect more CPS than RADIACODE. More advanced comparison tests are done by others, like on dosimetria, which also shows that RACID is able to detect more CPS than RADIACODE. We did see quite a good amount of innovation here, but is it the current peak of what we can as humanity achieve in terms of detection capabilities? Is it something that folks at CERN use? Certainly not. Apparently, you can just use a special type of a diode, so-called a pin diode, with an intrinsic layer in between P and N layers to be able to detect ionization radiation. Such diodes are used, for example, in ATLAS, that is the largest particle detector experiment at the Large Hadron Collider. That sounds like another interesting mechanism developed at CERN that can be commercialized and push the innovation curve of radiation detection technology. Pin diodes are an order of magnitude worse than many scintillation crystals, but we can see a beginning of a new technology. And look, it's less than one US dollar per piece. The future surely seems promising. Wait, you can even try this out yourself by a freely and cheaply available design from CERN? Nice. You can see it's hard to build a good device. It not only takes proper detection crystals, good acquisition hardware, but also software that is capable of analyzing the accounts that are being detected. In summary, it's good that such devices are available in the market, as the general public can learn more about their surrounding environment. It can be a great teaching tool for younger ones that may spark an interest in them for science, and as usual, the more informed the society is, the better. On top of that, the companies in the hobby scintillator space may keep improving the existing hardware and software to create new interesting offerings or more professional hardware. For more practical uses of such devices, you can watch one of the Project 326 videos. Thanks for watching.